You have one crowd of people that say resistance training, building muscle is the key to longevity for a multitude of reasons. Okay, we got glucose sink, like basically metabolic benefit there. You've got ability to stave off frailty, stave off like uh, wasting from disease, all very valid things. And you have another side that says, no, cardio is the most important because we have to look at cardiovascular health, we have to look at cognitive, we have to look at uh, endothelial uh, cells, we have to look at all this stuff. Both very, very valid arguments. And the beauty of social media is that well, we can get this stuff at warp speed, but the downside is that you get these new things that come out and these camps form that almost start demonizing the other side. So I've seen a lot of the muscle building crowd demonizing the cardio side, saying focus on, on just this building muscle. And then I've seen the other side of the equation. No muscle that's gonna be elevating mTOR, you need more protein, you need overfeeding for that to occur, and that's not good for longevity. So what is it? Okay, now I'm not just gonna come right out and say it's boilerplate and it's balanced. We have to look at data, okay? Now, what we have to look at first with building muscle, Yes, muscle is beneficial from a metabolic side, and this research is newer, so it's probably hotter and more exciting. From a metabolic side, having more muscle is going to give you this glucose sink, where glucose that's floating through the bloodstream actually has a place to go, right? And as we start to uncover more research and we see how many people in our society are insulin resistant or type 2 diabetic, it's top of mind, because metabolically and from a mitochondrial standpoint, if you have a lot of insulin resistance, you can do a lot of damage and it probably can shorten your life, right? And also the cognitive impairment that comes as a result. So all these things matter metabolically. Now on the cardiorespiratory side, the mistake that people make is pigeonholing cardiorespiratory fitness into cardiovascular health and cardiovascular disease risk. They think that, okay, well, I do good things for my heart, I eat a good diet, I exercise moderately, I don't need to worry about my VO2 max, I don't need to worry about having good cardio fitness as long as I'm just mildly active. I don't think that's the case. Here's what's interesting, is there's good data on muscle mass and all-cause mortality. So the more muscle mass you have seems to be good for all-cause mortality, up to a point. We're not talking like bodybuilders and enlarged hearts and exogenous hormones here. We're talking about good amounts of muscle. But why does that improve all-cause mortality? We have to beg the question there. Now, for one hand, there's the metabolic benefit, but with that, we're talking about structural things, okay? When you look at all-cause mortality, that also counts for being 85 years old and crossing the street and getting hit by a Buick, okay? And if you have more muscle, then you're going to be stronger and you're gonna be able to withstand that better. If you have muscle, you're also going to potentially be able to withstand the muscle wasting that comes along with potential disease. So is it directly impacting your internal health? Well, yes, it is, but all-cause mortality factors these things in, the ability to deal with these kinds of issues. It's harder to justify that on the cardiorespiratory side. Having more cardiorespiratory fitness on the surface isn't gonna help you when you get hit by that Buick. But maybe it is because you're gonna have better circulation, your endothelial cells are gonna be healthier, and you're gonna have better tolerance as far as perceived stress is concerned. So these things are important, right? We're gonna dive in a little bit deeper, and I wanna really focus on the longevity attributes and the aspects here, because there is an interesting study published in JAMA that really paints a solid picture with some stuff. After today's video, I do want you to check out Element, whether you're doing cardio or resistance training, they are an awesome electrolyte. I use them pretty much every day. I don't eat before my workouts. I don't take pre-workouts. I sip on Element because I like the 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. I've been using them, I guess, about three and a half years. And they have this mango chili flavor that is amazing. They also have watermelon salt and citrus salt, which are just phenomenal flavors too. Uh, they also have a totally unflavored one. So if you want zero calories whatsoever, not one or two that might come with the other ones, and you're fasting, it's a great, great thing to try. So if you're doing intermittent fasting, I think it's great to sip on all the time. But in the essence of talking about exercise, I think it is important. You do deplete minerals, especially the more active that you are. So that link will get you a free variety pack, a free variety sample pack with your purchase. So when you use that link, drinklmnt.com slash Thomas, it's a free variety pack along with your purchase. So this study that was published in JAMA took a look at 2,401 twins. Twins are gonna have the same DNA. This is interesting because it's looking at telomeres. Telomeres are like the ends of our shoelaces. They're with our DNA, we have these series of nucleotides. And as we get older, oxidative stress and other just 
problems as we age basically degrade these shoelace caps and eventually the shoelace becomes frayed and we have DNA damage. So in a lot of ways it's a protective mechanism. So we can measure sort of age in some ways by telomere length to a certain degree. It's only one element of biological age. However, it's a pretty powerful one and it was sort of the hallmark for a long time. And what's interesting is this particular study took a look at these twins and it factored in so many things. Okay. It adjusted for age, it adjusted for sex, adjusted for BMI, adjusted for activity at work, like how active they were at work, and it adjusted for smoking to eliminate those as variables. So when you say adjusted for, it means all these have mathematically been equated out of the picture, so they're not skewing the data. And what they found is that People that were more active, independent of all of those other things, even if they were crazy active at work, but not active in their leisure time, okay? It found people that were more active during their leisure time had longer telomere lengths. So they ultimately had better longevity health span. Very fascinating. Now it's not just a smidgen amount. They found the highest, most active group had up to 200 nucleotides more. You know what that equates to in time? 10 years younger. People that were active, the more active they were in their leisure time, independent of everything else, even if they're smokers, had longer telomeres and had ultimately, you could equate that to potentially better lifespan, better health span. Very interesting stuff. Now, why is this occurring? Because a lot of times what they're talking about is just cardiorespiratory health, just fitness, being able to going out and running, doing endurance work, things like that. So a lot of it comes down to the stress piece, right? If you do activity that reduces stress, that's going to be good, okay? Resistance training is good for the brain, it's good for stress, but it's also a stressful situation and very like stressful and attacking the body, whereas mild aerobic work, generally speaking, isn't gonna be as inflammatory, okay? You literally have less of an inflammatory response with moderate endurance work than you do with heavy resistance training, and that's kind of a given. Okay, so with this, we factor in how much it reduces your perceived stress overall. Now, does this mean that endurance work is better or cardio is better for longevity? No, but it does mean that if you're doing more cardiorespiratory fitness, it's definitely healthier. Now let's take a look over at muscle mass for just a second. Let's say you have great cardiorespiratory fitness, but you just eat 700, 900 grams of sugar a day and you're developing insulin resistance. It's not gonna help you out a whole lot there. If you're a 105 pound, six foot one runner that eats 600 grams of sugar, you can still be metabolically deranged, right? And that can certainly impact things later on. And that's where muscle mass is gonna come in handy, okay? And we've learned now that muscle secretes things called myokines, and muscle will also secrete things called exerkines. These are literal like signals and hormone-like compounds that are secreted when we exercise. And the more muscle that you have, the more of these things that you can secrete. So here's what's interesting and here's where it gets a little bit twisted. Perhaps the magic sauce is having a fair amount of muscle that is a repository for these myokines and these exerkines, these hormones, hormone-like things that affect our cells in positive ways. Having more of them because you have more muscle and moving the body with endurance work and moving a bigger muscular body is going to potentially secrete more of these. So is the answer to build muscle and do cardio? Perhaps. Now we look at a study that was published in 2022 in JAMA, again, 122,000 people took a look at between 1991 and 2014 and then did an eight-year follow-up in 2022. It found that there was an inverse relationship between low respiratory fitness and all-cause mortality, all the way up to the fact that the top 3% elite cardiorespiratory fitness, cardiovascular, like endurance work, and also just VO2 max, the top 3% had an 80% less chance of all-cause mortality compared to the lowest group. But you're thinking, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm still above average. Well, even this, they categorized them into low, below average, above average, high, and elite. The elite group still had a 20% less risk of all-cause mortality compared to the high group. The difference between elite and high was still a 20% reduction in all-cause mortality, showing that yes, by being really, 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 really strong with your cardio, it still has a really, 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 really cool benefit. So does that degrade your ability to build muscle? It does if you let it. The idea is, you do need to increase what's called your G-flux. You do need to eat more, but also move more. 
Okay, you still need to try to get yourself at net zero or slight deficit, but you need to be able to eat a lot of protein, in my humble opinion, based upon data, to sustain muscle mass while also resistance training and also doing cardio. But in order to not break down your muscle mass, doing lots of cardio that is left to make you be an elite cardio group, you need to maintain protein intake. And I don't care how you do that. If it's meat, go for it. If it's plants, go for it. I'm not gonna split hairs there and get into the granular with that. That's up to you. But the protein is going to matter at that point. And that's one of the things where people are gonna say, okay, well then protein is going to affect our mTOR and all this. Overfeeding, and I had a, a great discussion with Dr. Lane Norton on this. I know in the low carb community he's not liked, but he's generally well respected, even though he can be a little bit of a prick sometimes. With Lane Norton, like he had suggested like, okay, Overfeeding in general is bad, but the cohort of people that overeat but are also very active might be a slightly different situation. So overfeeding, eating enough protein by overfeeding protein, but also being active might actually come out in the wash where you get the muscle, but you're also being able to get the metabolic benefit of maintaining the muscle, which if you do a lot of cardio, you need to work hard to maintain. So which is better? Is one slightly better? Like if you have to lean into one more than the other? Honestly, I think the data as far as fitness level is concerned leans a little bit more towards cardiovascular health and cardiorespiratory fitness. Like if you look at VO2 max, it's stronger data with VO2 max than it is with muscle mass. But muscle mass data is just now starting to come out. We have a lot more in VO2 max, but it's stronger and it's more compelling. Now with that, I think that by increasing your VO2 max, it gives you a great baseline to increase your resistance training. Here's what I see as a problem. People are inherently a little bit lazy and we love to find something to talk about and be good at and become dogmatic about. And we don't like doing things we're not that good at. So when someone says, hey, resistance training is the way, we sort of get this like pacification where we're like, you know what, I'm glad he said that because now I can just be lazy mentally and focus on resistance training. And I can just focus on building muscle and I can do that. And the other side is true as well. Hey, cardio is all you need, you know, or cardio is the most important, you know, thank God you said that because now I don't have to worry about doing my resistance training as much and I can just mentally be lazy and focus on that. No, wrong. Okay, it's all about switching it up and it is difficult. And that's the point. It should never really get easier mentally. Like it's going to be hard to build muscle it's going to be hard to do cardio. It's going to be hard to do them both. But if I had to be put in a corner to say which one is more important, I'd probably still go with where the bulk of the data lies and where actually this newer study published in JAMA comes out. Cardiorespiratory fitness is important and it gives you the baseline to be a better resistance training person as well. I'll see you tomorrow.